Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Sustainability Dialogues in Saudi Arabia podcast, where you take a deeper dive into this massive transformation that we're seeing across the kingdom aligned with Vision 2030 towards sustainability, hoping to uncover some insights for stakeholders to help navigate the road ahead. Today, we're tackling the critical question of how green technology will advance future resilience in Saudi Arabia. And I'm joined here today by our special guest speakers, Dr. Abdulaziz Al-Shabani, Deputy Minister for Water Affairs at the Ministry of Environment, Water, and Agriculture of Saudi Arabia, Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud, Senior Fellow and Director of the Climate and Water Program at the Middle East Institute, Tarek Nada, Chief Technical Officer from Saudi Arabia, Vice President of Water at Aqua Power, and our host, engineer Zainab Alamin, Vice President of Digital Transformation at Microsoft Arabia. Zainab, I first want to kick off with you as the host to get your opening con comments on, on this topic that we're, we're tackling today, essentially. Uh, of course, green technology is a an accelerator to achieving these targets and these ambitions. Uh, absolutely. First of all, uh, Brian, thank you for uh, for having us and for uh, starting this podcast. And I would like to thank our uh, speakers uh, for being this, a part of this uh, podcast. This is a uh, first of a multiple uh, uh, series uh, podcast that are focused on sustainability around uh, five themes, which is uh, 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 which is climate finance, green technology, energy transition, and uh, circular economy and smart cities. Uh, and uh, when we look at water and water scarcity and this part of the world in Saudi Arabia, it's very uh, essential and very important in Saudi it's uh, Saudi Arabia is the largest water distillation uh, producer in the world with uh, 60 of its uh, water consumption coming from uh, water distillation and with uh, vision 2030 and uh, multiple initiatives that are happening this is a very important uh, topic and a priority for uh, research that was announced by uh, his royal uh, uh, highness uh, crown prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman recently uh, so um, I'm looking forward for the really exciting this discussion and uh, and welcome uh, welcoming all of you for this episode thank you dr al shabani i just want to to go to you for your opening comments obviously uh with the saudi vision 2030 put forward the kingdom's push towards sustainability water security essentially sits at the top of the agenda uh, what are your opening comments on the overall topic uh and the outlook ahead from your perspective um, thank you very much, uh, first of all. Thank you, Brian, and thanks to the rest of the speakers, and thank you for the Microsoft uh, team uh, for organizing this uh, meeting. Um, uh, when we talk about water scarcity, uh, I want to tell you that Saudi Arabia is taking this subject very uh, seriously. They could not be recognized. Um, the challenges. Uh, this is not uh, something very new. Uh, we have always been in this, uh, and we have always adopted and we have always uh, found solutions uh, through the means and tools that we have at the right at, at, at the time. Uh, so, uh, in recent years. Um, probably started with the uh, Saudi Vision 2030, and from it, um, many things came out, including the National Water Strategy, the New Water Law, uh, new policies, and, and um, uh, through the next 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you about some uh, achievements that we are very, uh, very happy to, to share. And I think uh, we have addressed the water challenges in Saudi Arabia uh, in a systematic way, and uh, we um, leverage the right tools and technologies um, to uh, manage our water resources right and um, to um, uh, increase the opportunities for sustainability in our natural resources. Thank you very much, Doctor. I 
just want to bring in Tarek for your opening comments, of course, coming from Aqua Power, being a part of the industrial side of solutions. Um, your overall perspective on water scarcity and, of course, the the ambition and the roadmap ahead towards achieving water security. Okay, thank you. And a very good afternoon and good morning to Dr. Mohammed being in the USA. Now it is like 6 a.m. in the morning. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Abdelaziz. I will, I will just take it straight forward to the technology portion of the of the equation. See the desalination industry uh, starting back late 60s in Saudi Arabia had made Saudi Arabia the capital of desalination by means of history all the way to where we are by production, by the number of the plants and the assets in the, in the kingdom. And we have been through a, a buildup of the cell technology all the way to where we are at the moment and the center or the, 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 the driver of the technology improvement from where it started to where we are building world largest uh, plants, state of the art engineering, the motto was nothing but the water scarcity, which is the main driver uh, here. Saudi Arabia and the desal industry has been always one step ahead influencing the market where to go because as you rightly mentioned, and Dr. Zainab and Dr. Abdelaziz, it is the main source of supplying water to the grid for the human consumption. So our desalination plants is usually built uh, to supply water for consumption, for human drinking water. So it is not for agriculture or industry. And that's why now we, we, we see building plants between 600,000 and 1 million meter cube per day between the private sector and the governmental entities to serve this purpose. So in terms of technology and answering the main question where we are gathered here for how green technology will advance it is that the technology itself is the core driver to make it sustainable for uh, the purpose itself. Just following up on, on that, that point is in terms of, from your perspective, we're looking at desalinization, as you as you said, is a, is the main source for delivering clean water, not just in Saudi but across the region. Obviously, it's very energy intensive in terms of desalinization. What progress are you saying are you seeing from your perspective in terms of making it more efficient and sustainable for the future ahead? I will tell you where are we at the moment and what is the next step. Where are we at the moment? Just com in comparison to like 15, 10 years ago, the, the, the desalination industry has reduced its uh, energy intensive uh, consumption in the range between 50 to 75 percent. Just just 10, 15 years switching from thermal to RO in a mega projects uh, just reduce this uh, power consumption. Uh, which is one of the most uh, debatable aspects in the seawater desalination. So this is where we are at the moment. So if you talk about in comparison to reduce 70% to reach where we are at the moment, you talk about something at the range of three uh, kilowatt hour per meter cube in comparison to 20. That's a huge step. And it was not even brought, uh, uh, projected uh, back in the early 2000, because at that time, the, 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 the main driver of the desalination, which is the thermal, was like, OK, it is mature and there is nothing uh, next. The next step came by changing the technology itself to introducing the reverse osmosis in a commercial large RO. And the private sector has been the main driver uh, to take it uh, next. So where we are at the moment is that the current desalination technology, which is reverse osmosis, is almost mature worldwide. The, 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 the extra fine tuning here and there is, 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 is almost making it between 95 to 100% perfection. So the next step to meet the 2030 vision will be something about changing the technology to a new technology. And this is where the decision makers will influence the market to, to go next. 
Dr. Mahmoud, I just want to bring you in on that for your opening comments. Uh, obviously, creating the right environment in which innovation and technology can prosper is a big part of this. What is your outlook in terms of the goal for water security uh, in the kingdom, but not just the kingdom, but regionally, internationally, given your, your expertise? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. And, and thanks for having me uh, join this very esteemed panel with uh, wonderful fellow panelists. Very happy to be here. Um, I think what I'd like to underline as part of my opening comments is really the need and the urgency. Um, uh, fellow panelists have highlighted, you know, Saudi Arabia's existing challenges uh, because of its constrained ability to access water supply, whether having the need to rely on desal or even limited groundwater uh, uh, supply. And so for a region and certainly a country that's a, a big part of the region uh, that's under uh, sort of the threat of water scarcity as a baseline, uh, the need grows even further once we consider the growing impact of climate change on the region and, uh, and certainly on the kingdom itself. Um, water scarcity issues, drought issues will get more severe, not just from a supply side. Uh, certainly, you know, there's limited uh, uh, natural sources of, of surface water supplies. Really, it's primarily groundwater or, or, or you know, ocean desal. But even in terms of stressors on demand, as temperatures increase, uh, there's going to be more need for water, both on certainly the urban and agricultural side. And so just this really underlines the need for better technology, for improved uh, a mainstreaming of green technology so that the region and certainly Saudi Arabia can, can be uh, more responsive and able to adapt better uh, in terms of how climate changes uh, can potentially impact uh, its, its sources of water supply. Zainab, I just want to bring you back in there. We're talking about technology. Of course, there's the hard side of technology with osmosis, but digitalization plays a crucial role uh, in water security. Uh, where do you see the advancement of digitalization uh, and digital technologies going in the future towards achieving water resilience? Uh, so uh, when it comes to technology solutions, there, there are solutions that are developed or that are being developed to understand water and water related uh, risks due to climate change. Uh, use data to reduce water uh, and uh, make smarter decisions about uh, water consumptions and improve the water quality and conservation. Technologies like IoT and AI are playing critical role in improving water quality and water efficiency. Uh, and uh, for example, there are multiple uh, technologies that are available today, uh, uh, like Azure IoT Central Government App Templates that includes uh, remote, uh, real-time water quality monitoring and water consumption monitoring that are geared towards reducing water consumption. Uh, there is uh, as well a huge room for innovation. Um, uh, water is one of the four priorities that uh, Microsoft have uh, committed when it comes to sustainability uh, to be uh, carbon negative, water positive, and have zero, uh, zero waste by 2030. Uh, and uh, build a planetary computer that contribute to the, the data available for uh, to, to support the conservatory uh, uh, the, uh, researchers, uh, governments, uh, and uh, research and innovation. So um, there is uh, a lot of the work uh, that is uh, that is happening, and much more that is uh, is needed, and uh, the necessity is there, uh, and uh, it's it's a matter of innovation. Dr. Al Shabani, just building off of that, you had mentioned. The, the achievements the ministry has accomplished in terms of technology uh, and working towards water resilience. Um, can you just build off of that a little bit and describe the initiatives that have been taking place? Yes, um, the use of technologies is at uh, the heart of our strategies actually, uh, and we recognize that, that we need to um, utilize technologies for um, everything related to water, whether it is uh, management uh, and resilience, whether it is um, um, production, um, detection of leaks, distribution, <clears throat> uh, and so on. We cannot, we cannot, of course, uh, ignore uh, from my position 
uh, in the, as the deputy minister for water um, who cannot ignore um, uh, the, the concept of integrated water resources uh, management um, because um, technology has to, to serve in a, in a bigger uh, concept and framework. So uh, uh, we take that uh, as our uh, model for, for managing our resources and of course uh, setting the national uh, priorities. Um, we need to know also that the largest consumption of water is in agriculture. Uh, more than 80-85% of water goes to agriculture. So we have to direct also um, uh, our attention to conserving and uh, con co uh, managing the demand in agriculture. Um, if we go back to the national water strategy, the national water strategy has um, five main uh, dimensions or, or, or objectives uh, that are availability, uh, quality, uh, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and uh, affordability uh, and and within the strategy it sets the uh, levers uh, and uh, the enablers among the enablers of course is what i already told you about the integrated water resource management uh, the supply chain uh, policies and of course technologies and and uh, managing um, monitoring and, and managing uh, our resources. Um, so um, Saudi Arabia has always been hot and, and scarce in water resources. This is not uh, something very new. But I, as I said, we have always uh, adopted um, even as early as 1930s. We, uh, during King Abdulaziz's time, uh, they they created uh, what we called Kindasa. It is a water distillation plant uh, along the coast, uh, the Red Sea coast. Um, we have studied the groundwater resources uh, in the 1930s and 40s. We have brought experts uh, and the uh, development of, of, of this management have uh, continued through the decades until the, the, the time we are in right now. Um, in terms of policies and, and demand and, and managing the demand and of course and depending on technologies on uh, desalination. Of course my colleagues probably are at better uh, position to talk about technologies in desalination. Mm. Uh, but uh, I know uh, our SWCC, Saline Water Convergent Corporation, leads uh, probably uh, world activities in, um, in, in uh, innovation uh, in desalination technologies and minimizing uh, the impact on environment, on consuming less fuel, uh, on, on reducing the, the footprint of, of, of uh, desalination. But also on, on the agriculture, uh, again, we depend on remote sensing on uh, monitoring water consumption. Uh, we de depend on smart uh, metering, both in, in wells and in uh, households. Uh, we depend on uh, smart grid for the whole supply chain for detection of leaks because we need uh, every drop of water that we have. Uh, so. Uh, uh, of course, it, we, we count on technology and I think um, the coming years will, will witness advancements in the use, utilization of technologies uh, along the, the, the whole supply chain of water, whether it is uh, domestic or agriculture or industrial. Just building off of that, obviously it's a, a massive, uh, let's say challenge, but of course with multiple opportunities for the future. Um, it requires uh, collaboration in a sense. W what is your outlook for enhanced partnerships and collaboration regionally, internationally, of course, throughout the kingdom with the private sector? What role do you see that playing in terms of the future of water resilience in Saudi? Okay. Um, we, many people uh, think that, that uh, water challenges are, are local. Um, 
but I think, um, yes, they might be local, but they have global dimensions. Well, uh, I'm from California originally, and they have massive water situation at the moment. Yeah. In terms of that. And, and again, I can use the, the example of California as, as um, an opportunity to learn from each other. We always do it, refer to examples from, from California and through the utilization of um, uh, treated uh, wastewater and so on. So um, I'll just give you an example of what we did during the uh, G20 um, presidency, Saudi presidency of the G20 in 2020. Uh, and we, we were engaged in this debate whether to uh, introduce water as part of the discussions under the umbrella of G20 or whether this is done only at a local scale. And we had very interesting discussions with the countries and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, our view uh, and, and had, I wouldn't say prevailed, but convinced uh, the rest of our colleagues from, from the 20 countries that we need to um, debate and discuss water challenges and issues uh, on a global uh, stage and, and G20 is one of them, but, but there are also other forums and, and stages. So uh, we need to learn from each other uh, on, on technologies, on investment, creative uh, financing solutions um, for, for water projects, on engaging private sector, um, uh, on, on uh, dialogue between uh, countries on shared water resources and, and on, on many issues. So I think it is, it is uh, very important that uh, whatever countries, um, whatever uh, local issues or, or challenges are good um, opportunities for, for other countries to learn from and exchange ideas and, and, and uh, solutions. Tarek, just building off of that, obviously, um, Aqua Power has done massive innovation within the kingdom regionally and yes. has international partnerships as well. Uh, yes. We're talking about knowledge sharing. We mentioned the G20 just there. We have COP27 coming up in Egypt, COP28 coming up in the UAE. Uh, in the context of Saudi Arabia, what do you see um, from in terms of water security that can be brought to the rest of the world? in terms oh. of that knowledge sharing and, and innovation from the private sector perspective. Okay, I will answer you, but before I just want to go back sure. to a statement made by Dr. Abdelaziz saying that uh, in back in 1930s, a Kendasa plant, just to let you know, it is few kilometers from where I am. And guess what? Uh, the reason to call it Kendasa because it is a condenser, so the local people refer to it as a kindasa, and it is still here, it is still around about, especially around about here in Jeddah, so people can have a look that the industry is almost like 90 years old in the, in the kingdom. So next time you are all invited when you come to Jeddah to see kindasa, which is condenser. And we have, to, we have to, to get all the stakeholders uh, around the world to visit as well. Yes. And Hopefully this will shed some light. Uh, uh, answering your question uh, from two perspectives, uh, what Aquapower has been uh, doing in terms of uh, innovation, especially in desalination, and the, 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 the integration with the private sector to be a major player in the, in the industry. As we speak now, we are, as a, as a Saudi company, uh, we are the world largest private sector in the desalination industry with a portfolio of 6.25 million meter cube per day uh, scattered between plants here in Saudi Arabia and with the GCC, uh, Emirates, Roman. Uh, we have entered the industry uh, late 2005, our first plant in 2009, and now in 2022, we just commissioned the world largest RO plant in Rabigh, and and, and the main, one of the top three main pillars to reach to where we are is the technology innovation. We have never built a plant, then we go next, uh, copy paste. It has never been the case. So we have almost 16, 17 plants. Each, when you go from one to two, two to three, all the way to 16, there is an extra mile. I will give you an example. For example, Rabagh, which is 600,000 
meter cube per day. And at the moment, it is one of the most, if not the most efficient commercial RO plants. Then we had to go build the same in the East Coast Jubail. But we did not just take it and copy paste the engineering. No, we had add the extra innovation part, which is partially powered by renewable energy. And again, we have the same principle in Tawila, in, which is 900,000, which is, will come into operation in October or November uh, this year. And now what we are thinking about next, okay, we have an RO very efficient and an RO coupled with renewables or partial powering, our next goal will be fully powered plants on renewable energy. Mm. And this is how we take it next by next. Although in between, this is when it comes to the new development of projects, the existing plants, the way we run, because by the end of the day, we are a private investor, developer, co-owner, then operator for 25 years. We just try to do the optimization based on o &M experience on time to time basis, even to enhance and current assets which is already existing by, for example, I'll give you two examples, by digitalization. And I can tell you it is one of the most promising uh, technologies in the diesel industry. Applying artificial intelligence or machine learning at the best, and there is a good part of it, which is there is a healthy competition out there in the market to provide it. So the the the, the benefit comes to the industry itself from technology perspective. Second is the decarbonization, and there are so many elements for decarbonization, reducing the power consumption, making the 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 the, the, the yeah, reducing the CO2 emission, making the brine which is coming back to the sea less. Mm. Uh, chemically hazard and there is uh, yeah, multiple breakdown to it which is we can take it in a further uh, form it seems that aqua and, power oh sorry if you want to and that. the last part of the uh, of the of the equation is as simple as this there is usually a, a, a platform gathering all the diesel industry uh, uh, main stakeholders under one umbrella which is ida and usually this is happening every two years and usually people will go there with the mentality of sharing the best practice, the lessons learned, uh, what, what is next for us from a diesel perspective from everyone in the industry under one roof. And this is how we take it next. So collaboration, communication, yes. the partnerships are a big part of that. Uh, but just from, from your perspective as well, it seems that Aqua Power has been able to accelerate rapidly the past five yes. years, for example, in this space. You know, we're talking about reverse osmosis, we're talking about a renewable desalination, I yes. would say a bit ahead of a lot of those who are in the industry right now. Uh, our stakeholders are obviously listening to this podcast are at different parts of their journey right now on their roadmaps. From, from your experience, uh, what has been the recommendations in order to accelerate the adoption is of the digital technologies that you just said to accelerate uh, the developments of these plants, uh, essentially, and kind of the barriers that were overcome in order to do so. See, as a as a, as a private uh, developer investor, uh, the main driver to 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 drive the technology next is to optimize what we call life cycle cost. Okay, we want to make water at the lowest cost, building a reliable, most advanced plants. So putting all of this into equation, the main thing to take it next is developing the technology itself and, and, and add the innovation part of it. And this is what is not a secret recipe at all because everyone is trying to do this, but we are taking it a bit serious. Mm. Dr. Mahmoud, just building off of that, obviously in any of these segments, the balance between people, planet and, and profit comes into play. Uh, what is your outlook for that in terms of, of water security and your recommendations on achieving that? We just mentioned the cost side of the technology. How do you see that progressing? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, you know, Dr. Abdulaziz and Mr. Tark, they hit on uh, a few things that I, you know, uh, I wanted to touch on further just in terms of how to achieve that, right? In terms of uh, achieving water security for the kingdom. 
and, and tying in innovation to do that. And certainly cost is a part of that. And the way I think of it, and I think, I think others share this view is there's a, there's a short-term track and a long-term track of how, how you incorporate uh, green technology or innovation to address some of these water resilience or water security issues. Certainly the long-term track is more on these, these innovations that improve existing technologies and mechanisms that are in place, things that are being developed more on the research and development side. The short-term track is leveraging existing technologies and practices uh, sort of on the green uh, technology front uh, in a different way. So for example, um, when we think of, let's say, agricultural water use, which is certainly, of course, the largest uh, sort of water footprint of usage in the kingdom, how do you reduce that water footprint while still uh, maintaining that same level of productivity for that agricultural in industry, right? So uh, how do you improve agricultural water use efficiency and potential conservation? So things like mainstreaming, uh, you know, through technology, drip irrigation, efficiently and optimally versus, you know, maybe not flood irrigation, maybe that's not as widespread, but still, how do you use technology to optimally apply drip irrigation? How do you use technology to optimally uh, uh, reduce water loss in the system, uh, whether through in the water conveying systems or in how water is dispersed in, in agricultural fields? Um, you know, there's there's ways where these technologies already exist. It's just a matter of, of, of pushing it a little bit further. And the same thing, you know, on the longer track, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Targ talked about, you know, improving the energy efficiency of desal, right? So there's, you know, long, I'm sure there's, in the, in the research and development side, there are a lot of organizations and, and research uh, um, firms that are looking into this, right? How do you how do you squeeze out more desalinated water with using less energy, right? Um, the other thing, you know, talking about water use, uh, looking at the urban side. So I'll give you another example of how to, mm -hmm. how to leverage existing technologies in a way that make them more green or more efficient. So when we talk about urban water use, uh, we have systems in place that uh, treat wastewater to non-potable water standard, right? Uh, for for use in maybe agriculture, for use in maybe uh, um, outdoor irrigation and lawns and that type of thing. Not there's certain challenges not... that come along with that, right? In terms of use for agriculture from different. Yeah, areas. yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So, so that technology exists. In addition, we have water treatment technology and systems that treat uh, non-potable to drinking water standard. An example of how to leverage existing technologies, why not link those two systems together? And, and, and this exists in, in certain parts of the world where they treat water that's maybe at the level of wastewater in terms of quality, all the way up to drinking water standard. So in a way, you're increasing that water reuse uh, uh, element for the same uh, amount of water resource that's originally been allocated or distributed for urban water use. So there, there are ways to, to certainly capitalize existing technologies uh, to achieve sort of a greener outcome while we're still waiting for these, uh, you know, innovations and research and development that take it to the next level in, in, in these various areas. Well, I think I have two questions as a follow-up to that in a sense, which is what would be kind of your short-term low-hanging fruit in leveraging those existing technologies? You know, this is a regional international challenge essentially overall. Um, and then when you look at new technologies, it seems that we are kind of in a place where there's a lot of pilot stages going on right now. We're in that pilot phase. But how do we scale up those technologies? It seems that scaling up to reduce costs and implementation is a, a big, I would say, opportunity but challenge at the moment. Yeah, agreed. And I think, you know, my opinion one of the unique um, benefits, I think, for these types of technologies or, or test beds, if you will, or pilots uh, to occur in Saudi Arabia is that I think there is, you know, compared to say other countries, if we think about the West or, or the US, there is, uh, let's just say, less restrictions in terms of from the governance level to apply these types of, of projects, mm. right? There is uh, more access to resources, more access to sort of a collaborative front where you don't have to go through a lot of uh, restrictive regulation or from a governance level, 
have to pass three, you know, pass things through Congress that, you know, in the, in the case of the U.S. or pass things through government take that takes forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It takes forever to get done. I think the benefit in Saudi Arabia is there's a willingness to uh, and more flexibility to to test these new technologies to kind of push forward in, in, in potential areas of innovations, regardless of, you know, success or failure. And I think that's a great, you know, great uh, opportunity is that Saudi Arabia has that flexibility, has that uh, uh, sort of opportunity to take that risk that other nations can't. And, you know, use the example of, uh, you know, what's going on with a project like Nguyen, which, you know, wouldn't be wouldn't be feasible in a lot of other places because of just restrictions of governance, of regulation, that I think Saudi Arabia has the benefit of, of, of embarking on these types of projects without uh, these limitations in a shorter time frame. So the environment is there, which allows for acceleration and innovation at the moment. Absolutely. Now Absolutely. it's more moving towards the implementation and how do we achieve essentially the, the, the targets that we're looking at. Sanab, I just want to, to bring you back in, uh, of course, from the technology side. Um, looking at from your experience where you see in the context of Saudi Arabia, uh, how that innovation, the knowledge that's been achieved within the kingdom can be uh, transferred regionally and internationally. Obviously, Microsoft is a global company, but with your experience within the kingdom, uh, what is occurring? How can that be transferred outside and that knowledge be shared? Uh, so uh, let me uh, let me first. Uh, I have actually two comments: one to Dr. Sure. Abdelaziz, uh, and then uh, the other one to uh, to Dr. Mohammed. Um, uh, let's start with the, with the latest one regarding uh, the regulations and uh, and innovation and what Saudi uh, can offer in terms of uh, innovation when it comes green technology in water uh, and how can that excel uh, an example of uh, a very good example of this is what what Saudi Arabia did with the fintech uh, and sand uh, the sandbox that was uh, created uh, by Sama where a uh, few of the startups and uh, were uh, allowed to uh, uh, use the technology under under that sandbox and that created uh, you know uh, great business models that are today uh, be getting uh, used and now CITC is building another sandbox for emerging technology so maybe that's another area that uh, that uh, that uh uh, that the ministry can take uh, to build a to have a sandbox for uh, water uh, and green technologies in uh, in water, which is uh, has been done successfully here and uh, working very closely with the government. Uh, I can see that that the the energy is there. The Vision 2030 uh, supports it, and all of the regulators are working very closely with us as Microsoft and through different advisory boards in supporting innovation that we don't see anywhere else in the world. Uh, which is really great opportunity for innovation. And uh, touching on uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, certainly uh, the water uh, issue and the water scarcity is not specific to Saudi Arabia, and uh, that is uh, for sure. It's uh, there. The world is expecting a water uh, crisis, according to uh, McKinsey and Company. Uh, humans uh, now withdraw about 4.3 trillion cubic meters of fresh water from the planet uh, uh, water basins every year. Uh, and most of it, as you mentioned, uh, are going to agriculture, uh, similar to what is happening here in Saudi, about 70 percent of that. And in, uh, industry only uh, accounts for 19 percent, where households are 11 percent. And according to the United uh, Nation Water, today 2 billion people lack uh, access to safely managed drinking water services and 4.2 billion people lack safely managed sanitation services. And then one in four people may live in a country that is affected by chronic shortage of water, of fresh water by 2050. So it is a global crisis and, and we are uh, in Saudi Arabia, we're, we're, uh, we're trying to achieve ahead of uh, of everyone are trying to address this uh, in a really uh, proactive way. And uh, there is a huge opportunity in, in Saudi being the largest distillation uh, water producing country in the world. And uh, on top of that is uh, as well, it's the largest water consuming or one of the largest water consumers 
uh, in the world uh, per day, and that consumption is forecasted to grow from 8 million uh, cubic meter uh, uh, currently to 12.3 uh, uh, cubic meters uh, per day. Uh, however, uh, Saudi can potentially become uh, a laboratory for uh, water management solutions uh, and the presence of multiple research centers and water technologies and the availability of international expertise and the very uh, strong uh, collaborative uh, government and initiatives that are working very closely with us. We can see it in uh, the mega projects, the announcement of NEOM, Red Sea, uh, uh, NEOM that aims to um, become a city recycling of all uh, of the wastewater uh, generated and eradicated the environment impact water distillation. Uh, also, lastly, the Crown Prince announcement of the directions of uh, research and de development and innovation uh, national priorities uh, a few weeks ago focused on sustainability and also uh, focused on water scarcity as one of the existential priorities that the country is focusing on and planning to achieve uh, uh, about 2.5 percent of GDP uh, coming from innovation uh, and research and development by 2040. So the opportunity in Saudi Arabia is huge. The uh, the policymakers and the government will is there, and the investment, the capital investment is there, and the t the international expertise also is is there and supports this. So I see the formula of success is really huge. Mm. So. You can see the the opportunity in terms of exporting that knowledge and expertise globally. As you mentioned, it's a, a global challenge. Um, Dr. Abzul Aziz, we, we mentioned innovation and research. We've spoken about industry's role in, in this challenge. We've we've spoken about the environment uh, which has been created to to help uh, stakeholders work fast and accelerate towards it. Those are three pillars essentially to a four pillar chair. Uh, the fourth pillar, uh, which a part of the national water strategy, addresses society, essentially. I just wanted to get your perspective on this, with Saudi Arabia having one of the, one of the largest youth populations in the world, um, having a society where there is large consumption of water. Where are the, the opportunities from that perspective uh, in which we can work towards in terms of water management? How can we better pro promote sustainability on that foundation level as well. OK, thank you, Brian. And I thank Zainab also for her comments. Before I answer this question, may I, I also um, give some remarks uh, regarding of course. Tariq and, and uh, Muhammad uh, Say. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad about the advancements made, made by Aquapower. And uh, I must say that um, part of that, of that uh, advancements is, is reflected or is a reflection of what is of the programs and initiatives in Saudi Arabia that promotes these advancements. Uh, so I, I just give you an example that <clears throat> for the plants to be built by uh, private companies, for example, private sector, uh, there is a condition that 20 percent for now of, of the uh, power source of the energy comes from renewables. Um, the SWCC is also leading research on um, minimizing the environmental impact. So in the future, you will see less and less brine uh, going back to the sea. And so, so um, I don't want to take some of the credit of, of the of, of aqua power, but um, the, the, we have a government that is very, very uh, supporting, uh, very agile. Um, we have less bureaucracy than than before, very adaptive and and very very supportive. Um, our ministry, Ministry of Environment, Water, uh, and Agriculture, is probably the first um, ministry, other than Ministry of Education, that has deputy ministry for research and innovation, because we really believe that um, technology and innovation will provide. Uh, solutions uh, to the challenges. We have to to count on, on technologies uh, for for sustainability. So back to your question, um, I heard more than once that um, Saudi Arabia is one of the largest consumers. I don't think we are uh, higher than the international standards or or, or rates. Uh, yeah. We, it. What is different is that we have. Um, 
population growth, a higher, probably high population growth. We have a very fast um, economic and, and industrial development um, that we have to uh, catch up also in terms of providing water services. Um, so, uh, as you all know, um, uh, from United Nations SDGs and um, water, water is is one of the or, or water service and and sanitation is one of the basic human uh, rights, and and uh, we have full coverage of water for the whole population of Saudi Arabia. There are KPIs that we monitor. If, if there is a settlement that does not receive water through network, it will receive uh, water through other means like uh, uh, trucks and, and, and or, or uh, providing uh, drilling wells and providing water in, in place. Um, I think um, as, as also um, Zainab said that or, or uh, I think you mentioned that Saudi Arabia also uh, is peculiar uh, in, in, in its natural conditions. Uh, in terms of geological setting, in terms of mm. natural setting, in terms of variation in climate and, 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 uh, and elevations. We have deserts, we have mountains, we have very high elevation mountains, 3,000 meters, that we have to get desalinated water across those uh, mountains. We have a network of uh, 9,000 kilometers of transmitting water. This is other than 125,000 kilometers of uh, networks uh, through through urban uh, cities. So I think uh, I, I go back to what I said at the beginning. It is it is management. It is the integrated water resources management. It is the utilization of uh, technologies in in managing in sustaining the resources. May I give you some examples of, of what we mean by this? Mm. We know that uh, probably Saudi Arabia is the largest. Um, in terms of non-renewable groundwater resources, and that's why the stress, or the what is what is defined as water stress, uh, we, we, Saudi Arabia is high on this on this indicator. So we are trying to minimize the, the dependence on this groundwater, on this non-renewable groundwater. We try to prolong its availability as much as we can. So we try to shift the support for agriculture to go to the areas where you have. Uh, renewable water resources mm. and we also um, increase our efforts uh, in rainwater harvesting so we build dams uh, we try to target places where you have um, higher rainfall uh, we support the agriculture that depends on treated wastewater for example so we produce about 5 million cubic meter uh, of treated wastewater Every day, we plan to use five million, uh, all of the five million cubic meter of treated wastewater per day. It will it will go up to ten million probably in 2030. We have plans to uh, transmit these uh, amounts of water to uh, agricultural lands where we will develop agriculture. We will use it in also uh, industries. So. Uh, again, it is all about management. It is about sustainability. It is about conserving uh, every drop of water, and that's why we also created a national center for uh, water efficiency. And and this is also uh, uh, this center goes to government buildings to check for uh, utilization, to check for ut efficiency. Um, it, it develops guidelines. It develops. Uh, awareness program. So we are trying to use multiple um, methodologies or multiple ways to maximize the resource, to develop resources, uh, to manage the demand, uh, to increase uh, efficiency so that we at the end we, we, tr we try to get uh, as sustainable as possible. Sustainability of course is a relative term here. Right. Just uh, unfortunately, 30 minutes goes by pretty quickly. It seems that the conversation uh, has been pretty robust so far. Uh, but just moving into closing comments, Dr. Abdulaziz, uh, uh, of course, you know, we're talking about the innovation, the management, the technology side of things. I would briefly mentioned youth there. Where do you see youth playing a role in advancing progress in this space? Uh, Saudi Arabia has mass potential with 
a younger generation. How do you how do you see that role uh, progressing? And of course, advancing the skill sets and sustainability. These are spaces that we probably didn't know would exist five to ten years ago, for example. Uh, what is your outlook for for that? Okay. Uh, this is this is also uh, another dimension that we that we also uh, consider. And and uh, of course, uh, the, the young generation is the future, and we we try to engage them. Um, we have a program of uh, capacity development uh, training. We, we work with universities uh, in creating new programs. And, and of course, that is the factory where we'll get um, uh, skills developed uh, with the young generation. We have hackathons uh, of, of uh, technologies for the environment and the water and the agriculture. Uh, we support um, young uh, youth and we support women also in, in, uh, uh, in agriculture and in uh, uh, small businesses and um, uh, funding uh, their activities. And I think, um, strongly believe that the, the, the breakthroughs will come through these efforts, um, if not today, tomorrow, by the, the, the seeds that we plant today in, in, these, uh, in these young talents. Thank you, Dr. Abdulaziz. Tarek, I just want to bring you in for your closing comments, uh, of course, as a round out to answering that critical question and building off of the Deputy Minister's comments right there. Uh, thank you so much. Although Dr. Abdulaziz covered everything, so he left nothing for us. But <laughs> if I would put something in the in the in the end, it just to 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 summarize and give you a life example in terms of technology improvements and next step. Now the system led by the ministry and the of taker and all the stakeholders we have a condition now for the new plants that the the, the, the of takers is giving you the flexibility to utilize percentage of the project finance itself to pilot testing so you have an actual pilot testing to prove by the end of uh, x number of years is this yes or no so to this extent that it is by governance that you need to go and show something for the new project financed to test a new technology. And again, this is will not be ever materialized without having a system led by the ministry and the off-taker and everyone. So this is the, 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 the good part of it, which is uh, very good for the industry here and for the whole world to address the water scarcity. On the youth, I just want to give you a life example. And again, uh, wouldn't be happen without the support of the ministry. Uh, two, three years ago, actually three years ago, in Echo Power, we just thought about, yes, okay, what are we giving for the youth, uh, which is majority of this country, in terms of showing how they can be part of, 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 of innovation in desalination to realize the importance and the scattering. So we ended up uh, launching a program called "The Power Is Within You." So we go out there in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the day of the National Day of Saudi Arabia, announcing it, calling the, the, the youth, males and females under uh, 25 years, uh, to come with an idea. Then we filter it. We end up with three every year. Then we host them, we adopt them, we sponsor them, we put them in the proper labs, we provide everything. And depending on their timeline, they will come and say, listen, I need two years, three years. So fully sponsored, adopted, everything facilitated for them to come with, with, with the end result. It happened. Now we are coming into the third year. I can tell you, we started by participants of like 50 to 100. Now we talk about thousands coming, but we will go with two, three of them. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdelaziz, Dr. Mohammed, Zainab, and... Uh, as you just said, we were planning for half an hour, but talking about water and desalination and technology cannot have a half an hour discussion at all. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud, I just would like to get your closing comments on the, the overall uh, topic as we wrap up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by uh, what Mr. Tarek and Ms. Zainab said about, you know, actual uh, examples on the ground of, of some of the things that are happening, uh, certainly with the youth and just... Um, 
actual applications. And, and I think I agree that uh, Dr. Ablaziz uh, has covered all the great points. So at best, I can only uh, maybe uh, modestly repeat some of the things he said. But the one thing I wanted to underline and highlight that I, he touched on, I think is very important, is this idea of integrated water management. And, and, and realizing that you know, aspects of the water system, both in terms of supply and demand, are very well connected. And, and the solutions have feedbacks that stretch beyond uh, you know, uh, one area to the other, right? So uh, I, I like the example of, of, of the use of uh, cloud seeding to, to promote more rain, you know, rain enhancement. That has multiple opportunities. And, and certainly when we think of groundwater as a non-renewable supply source, Rainwater, you know, rain, uh, rainfall uh, harvesting or cloud seeding could help to boost uh, those groundwater supplies. At the, and when you also think about things like uh, wastewater treatment, right? So when we do the wastewater treatment, yes, examples, we can treat it to a standard that's appropriate to apply for agriculture. We can also use that same water to pump uh, or to recharge these groundwater aquifers. Mm -hmm. So in a way at best, we could be increasing the level of these groundwater resources or you know at worst an ideal situation we're we're balancing out uh, the pumping with recharge so at least not not making the existing groundwater uh, resource levels worse same thing with uh, with conservation water conservation on both the agricultural and urban side any any sort of advancement that's done there could reduce the pressure on desal to having to meet that shortfall in, in, in water demand. So it's more than just, you know, we're increasing water supply here, we're increasing, you know, we're reducing water demand there. Any improvement in one part of the system has a feedback effect that's beneficial everywhere else. Groundwater, mm -hmm. increasing groundwater supply, uh, reducing, uh, you know, the stress on desal. And then by doing that, potentially reducing the impact of things from the environmental side as, you know, how do you, how do you dispose of the brine, you know, that type of thing. So. Uh, I agree with the notion of having an integrated water management approach that recognizes how all of these systems are connected and how improvement in one area can be seen uh, somewhere else. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, Zainab, I just want to bring you back in. Uh, thanks to Microsoft Arabia hosting today's podcast to give the final comments uh, to yourself. Well, it's been really uh, interesting discussion. And as you said, it's been planned for half an hour. Now it's it's much longer than that, but it's really interesting and engaging. And all of the points raised uh, by our great, great speakers are very important uh, in, a, in this very important and scarce resource, which is water. Uh, the opportunity for technology to play a role in its, in the management and to understand uh, more is there. So there are uh, technologies that are existing, AI, IoT, to uh, to manage uh, the water, but then innovation, there is a huge room for innovation uh, as well uh, to, to take part in this, uh, in the development of, uh, of uh, management and understanding of uh, water scarcity. Uh, it's been great discussion. I'd like to thank you all uh, for being part of this uh, amazing uh, podcast. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our speakers as well. Thank you, Dr. Adrilaziz Al-Shabani, oh. Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud uh, from the Middle East Institute, as well as Tarek Nada from Aqua Power, and of course, again, our host, Zain Alamin from Microsoft Arabia. But thank you very much, everyone, for your, your insights and intelligence today. Uh, for those listening from our audience, please feel free to follow all organizations and our speakers on social media uh, and, of course, uh, Microsoft Arabia's social networks where we will be publishing this podcast. And we look forward, of course, to hosting you all again uh, down the road for another discussion on this topic.